is by principle against gender discrimination and he would not see it. The privileged upper caste person would not see any caste discrimination because he doesn't feel it. All the three Semitic religions, all the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, God created man in his own shape. They both work, they both earn, but the man would come and take up his newspaper and on the television and it's the responsibility of the lady to go and make a tea. Well, she can make a tea one day and the, another day it shall be the responsibility of the man too, to start from there. So hello everyone and welcome to the weekend meeting with Sanalit Maruku. I'm Shubhi Sina heading the youth wing of Rationalist International and we have been conducting the Zoom conferences successfully for quite a few years now as well as our clubhouse and we are happy to welcome all of you here. Please note that in this session, our Zoom and Clubhouse will go on simultaneously. So once we move on to the question answer round, we will take up questions from both the platforms. Um, I would request all the Zoom participants to keep your videos and audios both off when the presentation is going on. Only when you're supposed to ask a question, we would request you to uh, turn on your videos and audio both for recording purposes. The pattern for the meeting would be as regular, where Sanal and Marku would be speaking for an hour, and then we will limit the questions to 30 minutes or maybe a bit more. So now coming to the topic, patriarchy and gender inequality. As we know, this is one of the most ongoing topics in the world. It might be controversial for some and a sense of concern for others. Patriarchy, if defined, is a system of relationship, beliefs, and values embedded in political, social, and economic systems that structure gender inequality between men and women. Patriarchy produces gender inequality, but its consequences run deeper than gender inequality. Patriarchy is a system, a dynamic web of particular ideas and relationships. To help us understand more about this and in a more depth of this topic, I would like to welcome Sanal sir with us. Welcome sir. Thank you Shubhi, thank you everyone. It seems that the internet is slightly weak and I mean the words were getting cut off, uh, but uh, I hope uh, still it was audible for everyone who were on the clubhouse as well. Primarily, the words patriarchy and gender inequality is well known all around the world now. This has been an active topic, an active subject, as Shubhi has rightly mentioned, for quite some decades. Every single person in the modern world who has a, a basic education and who goes through the fundamentals of uh, the social issues that we are going through would understand the very words patriarchy and gender equality. But what extent you would feel comfortable with these terms when it comes to real terms is a fundamental issue. Many people would feel that by principle, gender equality is okay, but in practice, it has some problems. I've heard even very progressive people asking me privately, well, it's all fine, but uh, well, that means that in certain societies, for example, like India, if uh, women go out at odd hours, there can be a danger. They need to be protected. Isn't what we mean by the, the male protection or patriarchy? Uh, I mean, that we, we, we are accusing of, but that's a ground reality that they are in danger. This is what I've heard from many people who are even progressive. On the other side, who would be against the idea of equality of the genders? Most of the people, most of the people that we know would simply by principle agree that men and women or other genders should be all equal. But should they be in actual world, 
in reality be equal? Is that the fundamental issue of discrimination in our society? Well, there is a very famous uh, story of two students, one from the black community and one from the white community, both in United States, both students in the university and both women. They were speaking about gender equality. The white woman, the white girl said that, I don't believe in any kind of discrimination that exists because I see all men and women equal. I feel equal to all men that I, I see around. If, I, if somebody wants to see me as a person who is not equal to him, that's his problem. I would not accept it. That's in United States, in a university where, I mean, very, very progressive students are studying, Harvard University. The black woman responded very simply. Well, what you said could be correct to you, but when I think about myself, I don't think it's exactly correct. What's the problem? The white girl would ask the black girl. She would say that when I wake up in the morning, when I look at the mirror, I see a person. Before what I feel, let me ask you, how do you feel? What do you see in the mirror? The white girl says, I see a woman. I see a human being. There is nothing more, nothing less. The black woman answered, there is a big difference when I see in the mirror. I see just not a human being. I see a woman. And I see a black woman. And I feel that I am underprivileged as a woman, number one, and as a black woman, more than other women and more than other whole people. Discriminations exist in this society. No matter you want to see it or not, it's a reality that discriminations exist. You can say that, well, I don't believe in any discrimination. Therefore, it does not exist for me. That's the way some people would like to see it. For example, some people would say that I don't consider any kind of discrimination that should exist in a society. I don't practice it. I consider all genders equal. Therefore, for me, the issue that is raised in the name of gender uh, equality, for example, the feminist movement is something I cannot accept or I cannot find it comfortable because the issue is in their mind. When they think that they are a woman, therefore they are discriminated, for them, they are discriminated. The problem is in their attitude to the whole problem. The moment you see that you are a human being, it does not exist for you. That's how some people would say. And who would say that? Ask anyone and look at their background. The white privileged man would always say that, well, there is no discrimination at all. The privileged man does not normally see the discrimination because it's invisible for the, the, the person. Every time the privileged persons feel that the discrimination would not exist. A society where racial discrimination is so prevalent would be understood better by the person who is at the receiving end. A discrimination on the basis of the gender would better be understood by the person who is at the receiving end. And you on the other side would understand only when you have empathy. And what is empathy? Empathy is when you can stand on somebody else's shoe and try to see the situation from there. Seeing from the other's perspective, if you can do that, if you have the capacity to do that, if you have the ability to have empathy, then you may understand what 
the people at the receiving end would be speaking. Otherwise, it will be difficult for you to understand it. It will be simply difficult for you to understand it because it's invisible to you because you are a privileged person. This is not only in matter of gender. This is same in matter with the racial discrimination. This is same in the, in the, in the case of caste discrimination. The people who are out of caste system in their mindset. Most probably the rationalists. But if they do not understand the mechanics of caste from an objective point of view, they would say that I don't believe in caste system. Therefore, for me, there is no caste exists. And those who speak about caste or those who think about caste discrimination are the people who are keeping the caste, they would argue. The same argument you would hear from a comparatively progressive man speaking about equality of all genders, but of course in practice he would not see any discrimination. He see that women can study. In his home he has seen women studying. In his community he has seen women studying. And he has seen his mother or sister or his uh, I mean, friends, mothers going and working in offices or in some factories or wherever it is. And they are comparatively privileged and he would always feel that why don't others do the same? They have the right. They have the privilege. It's their problem that they haven't studied. It's their problem that they are not going out. It's their problem that they are subjugating themselves to discrimination. This is how some people would like to express it or try to portray it or their narrative is in that language. Why is it so? It's not deliberate. It's not a, a deliberate intention not to see it, to put a blind eye. That's not the intention. That's a tendency in many people to not to see discrimination which they do not experience or they do not understand, which they do not go through because they are privileged. Therefore, the discrimination is invisible for them. That's one major crisis that we see in modern times in matters of gender inequality. Many people don't see the problem. Many people are unable to see the problem. Many people are unable to see the problem of racial discrimination or caste discrimination or gender discrimination. One side of it. On the other side, how some other people would react to it. I would like to address the whole problem with the fundamental issues that we, in the common life we see. This morning, I've talked to a very progressive a rationalist minded friend about the topic that we were going to uh, speak this evening. There were two immediate reactions. The first reaction was well, we should also speak about the discrimination that men are facing in this society. Well, that's an argument. White men are discriminated against, the upper caste people in India are discriminated against, or the white man in, in Europe or America is discriminated against, there is because there is affirmative action to support the weaker gender or the weaker race or the weaker caste. Therefore, they feel that they are privileged through affirmative action, and therefore it's underprivilege of the persons who would actually would not recognize the discrimination existing in this society. On the other side, I would take another example. I've seen when I was studying at the university, Jawaharlal Nehru University, I still remember one of my colleagues during our research program. One of my colleagues wanted to be a research officer. I mean, while we have been all going through the the, the PhD uh, I mean, research, one of them wanted to get a job as a research officer, which would give some extra money than the fellowships that we all would be getting. That's a privileged thing. Okay. 
So he, he could continue his research if he get that job, and that's a, quite an extra money, something like a university assistant professor would get. So he has applied for that as a senior research fellow. And later he came and said that, well, the, the word he used, I still remember, a South Indian Dalit woman stole my job. That was the word he, the sentence that he made. A South Indian Dalit woman stole my job. And what, what were the constellations involved in those sentences? I mean, we could discuss amongst other friends. One, that's a South Indian. This is a university in Northern India, in New Delhi. Predominantly, I mean, one could see Northern Indian presence in the university. There is not much South-North division in the university, but this person was coming from a family which considered Northern Indians more Indians than the Southern Indians. So he felt that the person who got the position was a South Indian, therefore it is not for his liking. One problem. Second thing, that the person is a Dalit. The third thing, that the person is a female. A South Indian Dalit woman stole my job. What are the words? Every single word was full of toxic content. Stole my job. What does it mean? The meaning is an inherent idea that he had in his mind that it was his job, my job. My job has been stolen by somebody else. From where that idea comes, that it was my job. My, that me is not a woman because it has been stolen by a woman. It was been stolen by a Southern Indian person. It has been stolen by a Dalit. Means it was my job because I'm not a South Indian, because I am not a Dalit, and because I am from a Northern Indian family, upper caste family. Therefore, it was my job. That's the inherent idea this person had, which was not expressed with any clear uh, expressive thought, but as an in inherent idea coming out from his inner self. He considered always that it was his privilege to get this job. It was his job. If somebody else would get, get it, that is stealing from him. It was a job meant for him. The privilege that he feels he should have or he has is something he wanted for him. And he believed that it was his right to have that privilege. And therefore, anybody else who would get it is against his natural right to have that position because it was his job. This is one clear example of patriarchy and gender discrimination that I have first time seen in such a strong way of um, I mean, expression. We discussed among our friends about this sentence. Over a whole, whole evening, we have been discussing about this sentence. He, she, a South Indian Dalit woman stole my job. Every single possibility of discrimination is inherent in those sentences. Imagine, that's what is working in most of the people when they think about their rights taken by somebody else. This is the second category of people which I wanted to speak about. The people who think that by principle everything should be fine. I don't see a caste system existing. I don't see racial discrimination existing. I don't see any kind of gender discrimination existing. But I feel that my job is stolen by a South Indian black, South Indian Dalit uh, woman is something quite an injustice against my natural right because it was my job. The sense of privilege that this person had. At one side, he spoke about 
non existing of any kind of discrimination in this society there is no discrimination between men and women there is no discrimination between the caste there is no discrimination between uh, i mean the geographical locality you come from this is how discrimination would work in a modern society it has much serious impact in a society which by principle accept that this does not exist and it should go and at the same time it follows you knowingly and unknowingly like a shadow we are far far away from the times of engels who tried to understand the nature of uh, i mean discrimination in matters of uh, race as well as in in in, in gender the modern society has a very different view about the gender discrimination in this society based on new values that we are following well everyone knows that uh, the idea that all genders are equal got enormous currency in the mid uh, 20th century maybe 1960s in the beginning of 1960s we started to see a big change happening in in the whole new world after the second world war it has begun that's why i i clearly mentioned half of the last century but by 1960s we saw a movement arising all around the world all around the world in the developed world as well as in the developing world and also in the develop under developed world in the urban cities that there is a strong discrimination in the society on the basis of gender and that has to go and the word feminism came as a terminology which provoked mixed feelings to a lot of people many people would hate that term many people even women would not like to be recognized with the term feminist for many people to be a feminist is anti men quarrelsome they are negating the social order and they are for all women against all men kind of social division that's how many people understood it or still want to understand it therefore i remember again another story from my schooling time i still remember that was in the 10th standard i still remember in india i was studying in kerala a southern indian state which is supposed to be a very progressive state in many regards because of the the first literate state in the whole country or the kind of gender equality that kerala has is much higher than many other parts of india and in my class i still remember there was a teacher who was asking speaking about feminism or gender equality as part of a class lecture there was a lady she asked how many of you are feminists i looked at everybody because i was hearing about this idea from my home because my parents both were feminists because they both believed on equality of men and women and all genders and we both my me and my sister we i think i and my sister we very clearly had this idea of gender equality maybe it's a privileged situation i know and i found that i was the lone person raising the hand that i was a feminist no single girl in the class more than half of the girls not a single person raised the hand and i was looking around and i was half shy and i wanted to slowly put down my hand because i felt something uncomfortable because i was the only person raising my hand and the teacher said hold the hand up don't take it down because this is a very important statement she said then she, keeping my hand up she asked the next question how many of you would agree to the idea that girls and boys have equal rights and there is there shall not be any discrimination between them how many of you would agree to that to my surprise almost the entire class responded to that and they all raised their hands so the teacher i still remember she was very clear about the whole thing she said look at the problem i used the word feminism 
there was only one boy raising the hand because for some reason he understood what it means for all others that's a word of abuse but the very idea that men and women are equal or all genders are equal is the content of feminism that is precisely what it is and it is for the equal rights of the genders that the feminists are fighting but you are afraid of the term feminism because it has a taboo now it has a wrong connotation in the public understanding of it so for against gender discrimination i mean all the class practically raise their hand though we all know that most of them would not actually in their private life in their behavior pattern in their homes or in the community or in the society in even the classroom they were actually not practicing gender equality in in its by its meaning they had a lot of ideas of patriarchy in their mindset registered and coming from their own families but officially they would like to be advocates of gender equality i still remember the teacher she said she said also she explained this and she further said but it's a good sign that you feel that it's more right to be on the side of uh, gender equality while many of you would not actually practice it by principles you agree you don't practice it but the moment you start practicing it there changes there starts the change in the society so ask anyone who is from the progressive side of i mean the defense they would all agree that they are for for certainly gender equality but when it comes to home the boy gets a privilege than the girl the man gets a privilege than the woman both of them come working and the man will lie down on the sofa and ask the lady to bring a tea for her to begin with i mean one of the finest symbol of uh, the equality of genders they both work they both earn but the man would come and take up his newspaper and on the television and it's the responsibility of the lady to go and make a tea well she can make a tea one day and the another day it shall be the responsibility of the man to to start from there a small example only and going further there are so many other examples that when we by principle agree gender equality it's not practiced in our society when we go in a bus in a public transport one needs the importance that women should get privileged seats i'm not against that but otherwise they cannot compete and get a seat in in a society where i mean bus seats are limited for example i mean that's a good example for any other things also when seats are limited there is competition and anybody who gets a privilege is seen by other people as a privilege when all the seats are for men if two seats are reserved for women to encourage them to travel more well most of the other people would feel that it's a privilege in favor of women. that's one thing this but look at the other side the first story that i i said when somebody in a higher level of education like jawaharlal nehru university where students with a very high sense of social equality still would feel that she the dalit woman from southern india stole my job that's another level he in principle was against gender discrimination but all the same he felt that this is a discrimination against him because he felt it was his right the moment you feel that you have a better right than the other persons you don't recognize that it is because of your gender that you feel it it's because of your caste hierarchy that you feel it or because of your geographical position that you feel it or because of your economic standards that you feel it or because you are in the urban city and others are coming from the rural part of the world that you are privileged the moment you feel that you are actually subscribing to the idea of discrimination but it's in- invisible to you you have seen free thinkers and rationalists even sometimes would defend the idea that there is no discrimination exists in this world 
all are equal if somebody feels they are discriminated it's their mindset they would argue which is absolutely not correct there are people who are discriminated against there are races who are discriminated against there are genders who are discriminated against there are communities that are discriminated against everywhere in the world no single part of the world is an exception discrimination probably is a part of human evolution there is hierarchy amongst animals you can see the most powerful get everything the powerful gets everything and the less powerful get nothing that's the rule in the mammal world look at the animals look at look at any animal who lives in a herd when food is served there is a food hierarchy amongst them the powerful would get it first the others have to obey or they will be fought against they'll be thrown down they will be kept out i've seen it in reindeer in deer in in any other herd in elephants everywhere you can see this the hierarchy of eating the hierarchy of mating this is a part of evolutionary progress but humans have an, gone through a new development which is based on the value system it has developed there are many kind of hierarchies in, in the animal world or in the mammal world but we have understood another level of value system that many of the animals would not have even imagined or could not have even identified we understood a value system based on equal rights and equal opportunities and an idea against discrimination it's not the powerful who would get in the human society at least our value system has ter- has taken a position very clearly against it because of your physical might you cannot have a privilege against the other people because of your gender you cannot have a privilege against the other genders because of your race you cannot have a privilege against the other people because of your caste you cannot have a privilege against other people because of your political ideology you cannot have a privilege against other people because of your religion you cannot have and with anything that we created or anything that naturally existed whatsoever it is to rise above all these divisions and to understand all humans at one plank is what we call equal rights of everybody equal rights of course does not mean that everybody would get everything nobody can think like my old university colleague thought my job stolen by somebody else that it was my job it was one could she, he could have said that our colleague from southern india got that job or the job not my job this my job is the sense of privilege that one exp- is what that is the point of expression of the privilege that he has which is invisible for him therefore the privileged man would not see any kind of gender discrimination he is by principle against gender discrimination and he would not see it the privileged upper caste person would not see any caste discrimination because he doesn't feel it he doesn't experience it it's not existing for him so it's invisible for him because it's invisible for him it's not a reality for him that's where subjectivity takes right and objectivity goes away he has to detach himself and see the society from outside him and when that is possible only that social empathy is built up only one can understand the whole issue and those men who would rise above this uh, the sense of privilege the sense of uh, not understanding the problem when they rise above that they would recognize the importance of new social order based uh, i mean on gender equality so who would do that we have seen a lot of great people who fought for gender equality many of them were men many people know about simone de beauvoir i mean that's the sarth uh, colleague and she has been seen as an icon for the gender equality fight but also you have to see that uh, ran paul sartre himself was a very great fighter for gender equality bertrand russell was a great fighter for equality 
and all the famous people that we know in the field of free thinking they are all standing for equality of genders many people not only from free thinking for example social change movement like frederick engels was one good example of a person who tried to understand the the, the whole problem from a socio anthropological level and tried to offer a solution there are many people who have been thinking about this problem j.s mill has been thinking about it so this the whole idea that people cannot be discriminated on the basis of gender i focus on gender because that's the topic today but these all are connected that's why i went into race as well as caste along with it now let's come to another good example about those people the third category of people who would consider gender as a real problem that exists but it's not only against women but also against men in some ways because uh, women are getting more privileges than men for example you know the, the traditional society i mean if you as as a courtesy when you go to a house the door is open first to the lady ladies first that's a kind of a fake idea that we bring we underprivilege them we keep them down but you give some symbols to make it all look different but there are still some the third category is gone going beyond that they would feel that in fact there should be some kind of patriarchy existing in the society because women are actually weaker gender they need our protection i've heard people speaking knowingly or unknowingly again uh, thinking that or trying to express that women are a weaker sex they are weaker physically weaker than men therefore they have to be taken care of they have to be protected they are to be in comfort with a protecting male well this kind of an idea was coming mainly from the, the semitic religions if you see the old testament of jews one would see many expressions in that direction that women should not go out in public without covering their head that was written in the old testament in islam you see similar things in in christianity i mean of course i mean old testament if one is taking that as a base this kind of an idea that women are underprivileged they have to be protected they have to be looked after by by men and man would look after the woman that's the whole idea that these religions projected look at other societies the hindu society the buddhist society which all evolved around the same time for example the hindu religion i mean from the vedic religion if you have seen the indian situation the vedic religion was a male dominated society it was all male gods in the vedic structures and the male gods were all living in the, in a in a special heaven in the, in the devaloka that they called they were in women there to make them happy by dancing and singing music and all these kind of things that's the world that was imagined by these people the men are the rulers and women are there to entertain them look at other <coughs> other semitic religions like for example islam islam has an idea very clearly that men are the privileged community and it's for men that women are there and men will would be for example after death they would go to a heaven who would be entertained by several women but women were not offered the same thing it's all for men the whole creation if you take the story of all the three semitic religions all the abrahamic religions judaism christianity and islam god created man in his own shape god is a man and god created man and it was for his company that a female was other set of people who certainly believe that uh, the social order is very clearly as per the semitic religions religious texts that it was all for men so they would believe that it's to be like that god's order is like that god's wishes are in that direction so they would insist on women to be protected by men 
women to be taken care of by men and that's the responsibility of a good man to take care of a woman you look at all medieval literature all good men or noble men are taking care of women look at the festivals in many parts of the world there are festivals the men are taking oath to protect the women i remember one very popular festival in uh, northern india where i was staying for a long time namely raksha bandhan raksha bandhan is a, a protection uh, tie that you have you are promising to protect all your sisters and who are your sisters anybody who would come and offer you a small thread on your hand tie a thread on your hand and give you a, piece, a small sweet would be your rakhi sister and you are bound to protect them not that is women to protect these men but men take an oath to protect them for ever in their life so the brothers have to protect their sisters the men have to protect their women and the fathers have to protect their daughters that can go to any extent the protection is from what protection from other men protection from anybody whom they could get attracted to that is the key of the whole thing the whole idea comes from the sense of insecurity that men have men have to protect them therefore they have to be in their control therefore they cannot go out therefore the men have to take decision for them from where this kind of insecurity come to men if you look at the whole thing desmond moore is speaks uh, in in length about the kind of insecurity that men have and he connects it very clearly to some fundamental issues of human sexuality that comes from the idea about continuation of your generations the the the, the genetical continuation the ancient man in early stages when they started grabbing properties and when they decided that this is their property and uh, they started establishing their own small little territories of their own their own little land their own little set of cattle their own field of for agriculture they wanted things to be protected with that and for that to be continued they wanted their children so the one comes back comes to the idea of a family where you have to protect the you have to ensure that your child is born and it is continued and how that can be guaranteed for a man in okay modern times you can find who is the father but in all traditional understanding there is no single way to ascertain the fatherhood of a child than trusting the f- fidelity of the lady and how would how would you guarantee it the only way to guarantee is ensuring that she is not going anywhere else she is always under your protection she is not going out she would not be meeting anybody else without your presence and when she is a child it should be the responsibility of the father to guarantee that she would not meet anybody i mean other than the family members and it shall be the responsibility of uh, the brother to protect that uh, the 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 sister is not meeting anybody else and it shall be the responsibility of the husband to see that she should not meet she would not meet anybody else than him because if she meets somebody that can be a threat to his ultimate desire to have his own child and it also further goes if you see the whole sexual uh, patterns that humans have a man cannot have sexuality so many times but a woman can have certainly sexuality with many times because of the structures that we have there's a huge difference this made apparently men insecure this is what despond more is trying to explain the insecurity of the men about his own sexuality which women would not have but men have could be the key of the whole insecurity that men have and perhaps the reason 
for the development of patriarchy. It comes from an absolute sexual insecurity of the men. If you realize that, if you understand that it's the fundamental inner crisis of a man based on his insecurity that the whole idea of patriarchy comes. The whole idea of male-dominated society exists. One should be able to move away from that. By principle, you would not agree that there should be discrimination. If you go, I mean, go by religion, of course, you would go by that. But religions are simply expressions of the social order that existed when these religions were coming into being or the religious texts were written. And there is no other value that any other religious text than understanding the social values that, that uh, it, I mean, the societies that created this, I mean, had at the time. What was the social value of, uh, I mean, 7th century or 6th century? That will be reflected in the Quran. At least the predominant values that were defended by the emperor, the powerful leader, Muhammad, for example, would be what, what you read in, the, read in that book. In Bible, what you see would be the value system that existed in a society where these stories were collected. But also these values were changing. If you imagine, uh, I mean, let's take an example of Muhammad's story. Muhammad was hired by a powerful trader, a rich trader, namely Khadija. He was the accountant and trade manager for her, a kind of uh, owner-worker relationship was between them. She was owning a very powerful business which was doing transnational business. It was she who hired him and later they fall into love and they get into a marriage. Imagine that. But after Muhammad's period, no such woman would take independent decision, independently run a business, independently decide for themselves and independently hire a man and offer the love to that man. That's not possible after that time. The whole social order transformed with a set of new ideas presented as revelation to the people. The value system has been completely shattered and changed into something different based on what existed in that society. There was a society when women could own property, women could run business, women could hire men, and women could offer love to a man who she has employed and live a life with her dominance in the structure. That is possible at that time. After Muhammad's time, that is all bad. Women are seen as your field where you can cultivate the way you want it. It can be interpreted in very different ways. I've heard many different explanations, but men are not seen as a field where women can go and cultivate the way they want. And they have imagined a heaven where only men are privileged and women are not privileged. So the values also have great influence by the people who transformed it into the way they want it. But it all comes fundamentally from the very idea that existed in the earlier times that men felt insecure. In Muhammad's case, it's a very clear case that, I mean, he was an insecure person because he was an employed person and later taken as a husband of the, uh, the lady. And uh, he got importance by the claiming of his revelation only. And he controls an empire later, but the new laws transformed everything. Look at the whole structure that in uh, Oriental societies, in Buddhist societies, I mean, one would generally glorify the Buddhist ideas, but in Buddhist societies, it's very clearly men, very clearly established that women can become a monk, but cannot lead a congregation. In Hindu faith, that, I mean, got in further development around this time is very clearly said with a very famous sentence, no woman is permitted to have freedom. This was part of the social order. So when we 
further develop when we understand that this was part of a sociological influence, socio-anthropological influence coming from the fundamental insecurity of the men and societies did exist before without this kind of discrimination. And there are still many societies that exist in different parts of the world, the cross sections of the old societies, for example, in Brazil or in Africa or in many other tribal areas where men and women are equals. There is no discrimination amongst the genders and they all live happily. Then why would we not? And why when we understand the fundamental crux of this crisis, why men feel either they are privileged and they have to control and they have to protect other people, one set of people, other set of people who would say that, well, women are naturally weaker people and therefore we have to protect, which is not at all approached anywhere. I will give examples of societies where things have changed, how it has transformed the societies also. But now there are another set of people who believe that they don't believe in any kind of discrimination, but without knowing, without understanding it properly, without even recognizing it, they would behave as if they are naturally the dominant gender. They would, by principle, they are against it. But in practice, they would not accept it. And fourthly, while understanding the gender dis discrimination at an important site, the other side of the whole thing, the first story that I said that, for example, would a black woman feel her discrimination as a woman more important than the discrimination that she faces as a black woman? What should be important for her? She faces two kinds of discrimination. As a person with a different race, for example, if one is living in United States, very clearly there was racial discrimination over centuries, though officially it has gone, still it exists, we all know. A black woman would feel that she is discriminated against because she belongs to a different race, which is not the predominant race. She would feel discriminated against because she, would, she does not belong to a gender that is not the predominant gender. Which discrimination is higher? The, her sense of discrimination that she faces as a, as a person of a race or her sense of discrimination that she faces as a person of a different gender come to caste system in India. A Dalit woman, is she discriminated mainly as a Dalit or is she discriminated mainly as a woman? Or does she actually face double discrimination as a Dalit woman? Many people don't want to see it. This is the point I wanted to stress from the very beginning. Many people don't see this. They are by principle against gender discrimination, but they feel that gender discrimination exists because you feel that you are a weaker gender. Caste is not a reality. Caste has gone. It does not exist in the society. Because you feel that you are an underprivileged caste, that is why you feel caste discrimination. That is why how some people try to explain it. And this is what I suggest is the invisibility of discrimination because you, it is convenient for you because you are certainly in the privileged sector as a male, as not, as not, a, not an untouchable, you, you are a privileged person. You are by principle against it, but you don't want to see it because it's invisible for you. You're not lying if you don't see it. It's a kind of blindness because you are blind, because you cannot see it, because you feel that you don't have it, therefore it does not exist. That's the most dangerous part of discrimination. And that's the one which is very difficult to overcome. And that's the problem that most of us face in this transforming society, because they are the people actually against discrimination, but who would not recognize that there is discrimination because for them it's invisible because it's a privilege, it's a luxury to have this invisibility of discrimination. If you don't see discrimination, which means only one thing, you are privileged. You have the luxury and you can afford it 
not to see any kind of discrimination. That is the fundamental crux. You have to come out from this bubble to understand the ground reality. Now, the most dangerous part, which I wanted to put at the last, we are, this is all what I was speaking was about the transforming societies where people started understanding the issues of patriarchy as well as gender discrimination. But there are societies where still many people who do not want to recognize the right of a weaker gender or any gender than a man to go to school, to study, to understand, to come to leadership. In the very famous case of Malala, you all know. Look at the situation in Afghanistan. There is a male patriarchal religious society which is in power. They believe that men are privileged. They believe that their religion is privileged. And they believe that all others are underprivileged and all other women are underprivileged. So they need not study. They should not go to school. And women shall be there to entertain the men. There is no other responsibility for women. That's how they see it. But they would not even use the other language that by principle we agree all men and women are equal. They would not agree. They are very clear about their view that men are privileged and women are underprivileged and that shall be like that. And if anybody who would oppose that should be killed. That is their value system. Schools are closed in Afghanistan for girls now. By force, it's stopped now. There are communities similar in with similar fashion existing in Sudan, in Nigeria, in Eritrea, many parts of the world. Women are not allowed to go to school. Just because their societies, their religions, their communities, their value system would not allow women to study. They were not supposed to study. If they study, they would raise questions. If they study, they would not accept the social order. In many of these societies, they would try to discriminate women for having sexual happiness. There are more than 20,000 girls every year going through genital mutilation. Female genital mutilation. Genital mutilation is such a big thing, which is not seen in many parts of the world, the urban modern world want to have a blind eye on that. In many communities, the genital mutilation is done to reduce the sexual happiness, possibility of sexual happiness of a girl. Because they should not have this hair. They are only the objects for, the, for fulfilling the sexual desire of the man. In fact, by a coincidence, I want to mention that the genital mutilation of men also started in the same fashion. It was started in societies in Egypt, especially for the slave soldiers, that they should their sexuality or send their interest in sexuality should be reduced. So in Egypt, the slave fighters got circumcision because the nerve centers in, in your phallic organ, the sexual organ, are a major part of it are removed by circumcising, by removing the foreskin. So it was done to reduce their sexual interest so that they concentrate more on their war and their work. Later, this became a tradition in many ancient societies, including the Jedi society, and this became a part of the Islamic tradition also. There will be many people who would argue with a lot of uh, fantastic arguments claiming that uh, this would be good for their health and in fact that will help them from not contracting any sexually transmitted ailments. All fantastic and uh, colorful stories they would make. They want sanction from religion to have their uh, faith sanctified. But that's out of this subject. But the female genital mutilation is something that is so widely prevalent in many parts of the world, especially in Northern Africa. If you read Ayan Hershey Ali's famous book uh, about her life, you could read a chapter about the kind of trauma that she had gone through when she was genitally mutilated when she was a young child. So genital mutilation at one side, stopping education at the other side, 
all by a male dominated society because the society very clearly understood that they should not have sexual enjoyment they should not have education because they have a purpose they have a purpose to entertain the men to keep the society running so that is the worst form of discrimination kind of absolute slavery in the mindset luckily that section of people are not in the rise at this moment they are getting reduced but i would come back to the first section of people who by principle agree that all men and women are equal but they would not want to accept in their personal life the kind of discrimination look at the modern societies women are less paid of the same job even now even in many developed countries the same job women are getting less salaries if you look at the higher executives in many organizations the number of women in developed countries their number is comparatively less but at the end of the day these people who by principle agree for uh, i mean the idea of equality of genders and again they who are by principle against gender discrimination which practically without knowing because it's invisible to them they would practice it but there are societies that transformed i would come with one small example any society that would recognize and accept the right of women the full right of women their equality as i mean like any other person without any discrimination that societies would be happier such families where gender equality is guaranteed the couple are living happily there are statistical evidence about successful families when gender equality is absolutely guaranteed that both of them have equal rights there are more comfortable more happiness in that families children have lesser problems less children are going later i would publish the studies about that there are documented evidence that when families maintain this absolute gender equality the children are less in trouble very few of the, the, that children would go for any kind of depression because they are comforted because they are confident they have lesser problem and if you look at societies look at the societies which are on the high end in the happiness index in the world all those countries who are high in the happiness index are countries where there is absolute gender equality look at the first 10 or 15 countries in the happiness index all these countries are having the highest form of gender equality the idea that women cannot drive a truck is no more existing in all these countries the women the idea that they cannot work in the night does not exist in these countries the idea that men have to protect women that does not exist in these countries the idea that women cannot take big responsibilities does not exist in these countries i mean it's not because i live in finland that i speak about finland but look at the example of finland which is number 1 in the world happiness index finland is the prime minister of finland is a female she is the youngest prime minister in the whole world there's a coalition of five parties that are ruling in finland all the five parties have their presidents women it's a women ruled country and every single household in finland the idea that a man has to protect a woman is absolutely absent there can be some families of immigrant people but the people who are integrated to the finnish society this idea is absolutely absent you you go to sweden it's not existing there you go to estonia it doesn't exist there you go to denmark norway all these countries have come out of this phase all these countries which are successful which are happy have gender equality completely established in their societies and look at those countries in the down part of the happiness index those are the countries where gender equality is not at all guaranteed sudan congo eritrea 
these are the countries where gender equality by principle comes to the fifth level by principle the society believes that women are not allowed to have equal rights they are not encouraged to go to school such societies are the the most unhappy countries so if you want a society that is happy confident and respecting each other if you want to have a society that is thriving that is more comfortable for all the genders that should be a society where gender equality exists in the fullest form of it no kind of patriarchy directly or indirectly is to be recognized or accepted or valued in a civilized society we all have to ask ourselves many of us would say that by principle i agree about gender equality but do we actually practice it do we actually look at your female to cook your food do you actually both of you go to work and when you come back you want your lady to make your food and you want to relax understand that this i mean you are in a society which is living in a hypocritical world you speak about gender equality but you don't practice it starting from these small things every single part of our life you have to look that are you living with a person are you dealing with a person who are seen beyond their gender as an individual can you ever see your other gender as an individual without thinking about their gender do you see a female as a woman or as an individual if you see the person as an individual beyond their gender you behave normally you don't have to think about sexuality when you see a person of any other gender well sexuality is not only connected with the gender you know that i mean it also can be connected with the same gender you don't deal with a person always in connection with sexuality the whole idea of gender discrimination or gender inequality stems from the idea that the sexuality of the other per- person is to be controlled because you are the custodian of the person that's the whole key you are insecure you want to be sure and you are not since you are not sure you want to use force to attain what you wish to have and many other people they want to accept the idea of equality but they don't see the discrimination they feel the discriminated structures that they are following are natural and that is the most indiscriminate way these are the several levels that we go through primarily recognize the individual without thinking about their gender you should be able to walk with a person talk with a person deal with a person work with a person without thinking about their gender and two persons when they work together it's not only sex that is in the whole thing they can work as colleagues they can work as friends they can work as i mean partners that's not only sex the fear of sexuality by the insecure person is the key of the whole thing come out of that and let's have a society where we live happily by respecting each other beyond the genders thank you very much yes good evening sir so my question is sir as a, in all religion we found a lot of discrimination against women that's okay they maybe their religious text or the leaders or something like that so in communism i'm talking about the communist communist party so they started as a social yeah. reform socially and economically reform party there also we cannot find any women representation even if you take it the ussr grew in the mm. politburo or in china or in so called in kerala democratically elected government also we cannot find any any portfolio given to women in a portfolio a serious portfolio they all get a health ministry so, such sort of a thing so don't you think there is a discrimination in communism also um most of the parties you know uh, i mean including communist parties most of these parties by principle they are for equality if you ask about the gender equality by principle they would agree the idea of gender equality but they are not in a position to practice it in their party why for example if one says that i mean if there is only one person in the politburo of uh, cpim 
I mean, who is also the, the partner of uh, one another Politburo member. Most of these people are partners of the Politburo members who are coming to the Central Committee also. Why independent women are not coming very, very much in the seat? Why at least in society there is a huge, I mean, almost equal men and women? Or why they are not coming up naturally to the leadership? This is a very serious question. You can also ask the same question to any other party. Look at uh, the ruling party, BJP. I mean, who are in the leadership? Is there equal participation in BJP? No. Equal participation in the leadership of Congress. There are sometimes Congress leaders like Indira Gandhi coming. I mean, but they are also coming from families which are politically very powerful. But otherwise, if you see if there is equal participation of uh, both the genders or other genders in the, in, the, in the Central Committee or the All India Congress Committee, you don't see it in any party in India. There are parties which are led by women, powerful women. Mamata Banar, Indira Gandhi, you have a lot of example. Sucheda Kripalani, there is a lot of example. But uh, the general participation of women in Indian politics is very less. But even when there was a reservation, a quota offered to the panchayats for women, one third, uh, there has been huge opposition from the male dominated political parties. That also one has to see. The society is symbolized by its political system. Very clearly, India is a country where there's a lot of discrimination against women, and that's seen in all sectors of our society, including the political spectrum. Absolutely right that uh, the left parties, including the left parties, the ma- all the major parties are keeping their women folk. I don't say that they're keeping them off, but women are not naturally rising up in these parties as men would rise. It's a correct observation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I ask one more question? So you talk about the gender rights of male and female. There's one more gender, transgenders. So they are also discriminated a lot in the society. So you didn't mention anything about them. So I just want to have a take on that. I did not mainly speak about male and female. I, I, I find that we should have a system that gender is not the issue when see a person. When I see Ritish, for example, I should not bother whether Ritish is a man or woman. That's what it should not make any difference. I mean, I should be able to talk to you or deal with you or work with you or talk with you or walk with you, even if you are a female. That kind of or any other gender in that way. For example, I'm in close connection with the transgender community groups also. And I mean, many of them would explain to me that the wide spectrum of genders is not only man and woman and transgender, because it's a wide spectrum that many, many men are closer to women. Many people can change their genders. I have a very close friend who has decided, who was a man for a long time and decided to become a female, went through the whole process and became a female. So people are there. I mean, also I have one of my closest friends in Finland whose uh, um, sister, I mean, when he visited, I mean, last time I asked about his sister, he said, well, the sister is no more existing. She is a boy now. She transformed herself into a boy. This is all happening in different parts of the world. You can decide your gender. You can transform your gender. You can decide what you want to become. And also, this wide spectrum is not limited to man, woman, and transgender because the kind of wide spectrum involves many levels from zero to 90. I mean, you can find people at different levels. Like, like in sexuality, I mean, it's not only man-woman relationship. There is man, man and man relationship. There are women and women relationship. There are bisexual people. I mean, these all are existing in this society. In a modern society, we have recognized all these wide variants in, 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 in our understanding. So our times have understood a lot of things, with, I mean, than our earlier generations. And of course, I fully recognize the wide spectrum that includes those people who are called as transgenders. But I would say that uh, from the full man to the full woman, there are a, it's a wide spectrum. There are so many different levels of people. All are equal. There is no difference. We should be able to see people as people beyond their gender. I would fully accept that position. Yeah. Thank you. See, yeah. uh, you have been a, a total, uh, how the over a period of uh, years, how these things are evolved and how the uh, discrimination uh, among the genders is carried out and all that. You are absolutely right when you say in the Indian context, it is a very highly discriminated society initially. And as you said, when a 
Uh, the female in uh, when it is in a kid stage, father has to take care. In adult stage, husband has to take care. When she in the old age, the son has to take care. It is absolutely so. She is uh, she is uh, not dependent uh, independent. But of late, uh, with the last twenty years, when the technology uh, developed, especially in India, the lot of uh, IT sectors, we see the girls who were. Uh, Uh, conventionally they were confined to their house and villages now they come out they come out in uh, uh, the jean pants they work in shifts they travel abroad and they are totally empowered and uh, this discrimination in that sense it is gradually uh, going out similarly if you see in uh, saudi arabia uh, the where the ladies are totally confined to the house now even they were allowed to drive the car they can go and see the movies so what i'm trying to say is over a period of time when the whole technology science and technology grows and the world is moving forward will this discrimination automatically wither away or not this is my doubt thank you thank you chandrahasa i would say that uh, your observation is right that things are changing things are changing in uh, even if you see, i mean see the uh, the worst side saudi arabia where women were not allowed to drive even they were not allowed to go without the assistance of a male member of the family now they are allowed to drive they can go to a cinema they can go to a boxing competition so we say that this is allowed in quotation by the yes. the male authorities therefore they can do certain things but still that's not enough i mean for example the equal participation of women means quite a lot that doesn't mean that these small things that they achieved are important they are important but you have to understand that uh, i mean a, a few hundred years back new zealand has given equal rights of voting to women and secondly first new zealand and then finland and other countries followed but even that came some decades or a few centuries back only so the whole idea of women participating in the political process was not recognized by societies earlier looking at saudi arabia and the transformation that's happening there we have to even understand that there is not even a democratically elected government it's a monarchy there so the kind of freedom to elect their own ruler is not there on the other side there is no possibility for a woman to become a monarch even and there are a lot of transformation occurred in those societies even when small changes come we are very happy because that was a very confined society and very very controlled society and even little changes are very relieving for us certainly that's a good sign things are changing as you rightly said in urban india things are changing but still you have to understand that even for example one of the most developed countries in the world in united states women are still discriminated against there are many people who recognize that women are less paid than men they have i mean almost equal rights for example if one sees from india they have a lot of rights but that's still not enough so absolute equality of all genders would come up eventually but the, we have to accelerate it to make it faster so that generations are not lost in that process the earlier we achieve it the better it is that people who are living in this generation who are still alive also can experience it well it all will change but if it goes after 10 generations we lose nine generations in between without having equal rights so let's try to have it as early as possible the earlier the better because the more people will be benefited with it thank you i understand thank you yeah yeah i am deeply moved by your statement that uh, the women uh, are very the women they are facing double Uh, sort no a double problem actually they are facing as a dalit and they are also facing the problem as a female that is i, I am actually i am also now only i think about that paradox so it's i mean i fully agree mathu i mean the- yes sir so sir this is a very pertinent uh, topic which you have taken up today about patriarchy and gender equality so one thing in india we see when we talk about you know uh, female means women being not treated properly so many people they say what in india we worship women like uh, during navratris goddess durga is worshiped 
and there are so many goddesses. So where is that discrimination? In fact, women are uh, more kept at a pedestal. So I find it very funny because on one hand, you by glorifying women as a goddess, you make it more difficult for the women because instead of treating a person as an individual, as a human being, we are treating a person as a goddess and our expectation from goddess is for her to do miraculous things and we load her with all the work saying that she has got 10 hands and she can do household work, she can do work outside. But one thing which I see is not only the problem is with male people, the problem is also with the, you know, I find that the females also don't recognize the this problem of glorification of women as goddess. Or I find that many women, they like that when we open the door for them or we pay the bill in the restaurant and like it. And and confuse it as a part of empowerment or being means. So how should we make sure that this Indian society as such understands what is gender equality and what is not means there are some some steps which the government does which seems to be more uh, means they try to be more right than what is required means just because a woman became the prime minister of the country or a woman is heading like Congress party or something does not mean that the whole mass as such is having a equal, means having a proper life. So how do we do means that conditioning happens in our society from our childhood itself. Means the girl child is allowed to go to the kitchen, the boy child is discouraged from doing household work or household code. So how should the society change? This is my question to you. Um. Satarshi, that was very important question because how to change the whole structure? I would say that, you know, as a person like me who was born to very liberated parents, my both parents who are very clearly in their understanding about equality of men and women. My mother was the first accredited woman journalist in the, Ker in the state where she lived in Kerala. So, and I was brought up in such a family, but I still, with my upbringing in India, I carried a lot of ideas about you know, this invisible patriarchal mindset that I have. For example, I remember when I was in Finland, I had to have a discussion with an important person, I mean, in the, in the bureaucracy, and the, uh, that happened to be a female. And uh, as a courtesy, normally, when you go for food, uh, the male would pay the bill of the, the, the female. That's a normal courtesy in many parts of the world. Okay. I offered to pay the bill. So immediately there was a response, which was an education for me. Well, I mean, I know your Indian mindset thinking that a man has to pay for a woman, but I earn enough to pay my bill, very friendly. So maybe, I mean, if you feel that one has to pay, I would prefer to pay for you. That was the uh, sentence that has opened my eyes in a, in a way that without knowing, the, the you know, the, that's a patriarchal behavior. A male has to take care of the person. A male has to open the door for a female because he's the protector. So this, from these fine small symbols, from many, many, many parts of the whole structure, where patriarchy follows us. But coming straight away to glorifying the woman as goddess and, and treating her very bad by not giving her her rights, by taking away her rights, is the worst part of it. You worship her. You, you praise woman as a goddess. But... You don't allow her right to decide for herself. That's the worst part of it. So no woman or nobody want, wants to be glorified as a god or goddess. People want to be treated as equals, just as equals. Every single person is equal to the other person. No matter what gender you have, no matter what race you have, no matter what faith you have, no matter what nation you come from, everybody is equal and we all have to respect that and accept that. That's the key of the whole thing. Thank you. So, uh, shall we wind up then? I'm thanking you and uh, all the admin panel and all the people uh, who came here to listen us. Thank you all. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Then we come to an end. <laughs> <laughs>